Hi, my name is John Maxwell, and I'm very excited that you're not only with me for this training tape, but for another one or two later on, because here's what I know. I'm going to teach the five levels of leadership. In just a moment, you're going to learn not only how to influence people, but how to grow in that influence. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a meeting and people were talking and you knew you had some good ideas, but somehow you either didn't speak up or when you spoke up, it seemed like nobody was listening. And you thought to yourself, wow, I wish I could present a good idea that everybody would kind of take off on and I could truly kind of become a catalytic leader to that group. Well, I'm about to tell you how to gain your influence level to such a degree that when you speak, people listen. <laughs> Better than that, when you lead, people follow. Hang on as I teach you the five levels of leadership. Every time you climb a step, you have put another foundation underneath your leadership belt. The key to getting people to be successful is to put them where their strengths are. Your team has to be equal with the level of your dream. Your future isn't based on your organization. Your future is based on you. Today I would like to talk to you on the subject, the five levels of leadership. In my book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, I talk about the, the law of influence. The law of influence basically says the true measure of leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. You see, the number one question I think of a leader who really wants to lead others is this question. How do I increase my influence with people? In other words, very simple. If I'm to be a, a good leader, if I'm to be an effective leader, I have to influence people. And I spent a lot of time helping people understand that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less, and that if you really want to increase your leadership ability, increase your influence ability. That's really key. In fact, I wrote a book a few years ago that just talked to you about how to increase your influence. It's called Becoming a Person of Influence. I talk about 10 ways to increase your influence in that book because I want to help people understand that as you increase your influence, you increase your leadership. Leadership's not title, it's not position, it's influence. Nothing more, nothing less. In this session, I'm going to share with you the five levels of leadership. And when I talk about the five levels of leadership, I could just as well be talking about the five levels of influence. I use those two words interchangeably. So for your notes and in your workbook, I'm going to walk you through the five levels of leadership and I'm going to try to help you to understand how to go from step one to step two to step three to step four, <laughs> someday eventually perhaps even be what I call a step five influential leader. Let's go to the first step. Let's go completely down to the ground floor. On level number one, the key word is position. You see, at this level, you have a certain position. You have a job. You have a job description. You have a title. People have given you a position of which, in that position, you have certain rights. In fact, beside the first step position, put the word rights, R-I-G-H-T-S, because what I want you to understand about le level number one is, at this level, people follow you because they have to. In other words, they follow you because, you know, you're the boss. You, you, you've got the paycheck. What is sad is, many, many times I run into people who think that if they have a position of leadership, that is the ultimate of leadership. But it's not. In fact, it's, it's okay, but it's level number one. It's where you start. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with starting at level number one. We all start at level number one. But what's sad is when I run into people who are stuck on level number one. They're still trying to lead people by position. They're still trying to, to say, this is my job, and your job is to follow me. And, and they're frustrated, because what happens is, people will follow you, but they don't want to follow you. They, 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 they only do that because you have leverage on them. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever had a boss, ever had to follow somebody that wasn't a good leader? 
You know exactly what it's like. You hate it. You hate it because you, you, you maybe see farther than they see, you perhaps know more than they know. It's not any fun. And when you're at level number one, it's a starting level, but that's all it is, and it's nothing more. So as I go over here to level number one for a moment, I want you to understand this. This is where we all start. If you have started there, it's okay, but you don't want to stay there. This is the foundation of your influence. This is the foundation of your leadership. It certainly is not the end. So let's go to level number two. You see, level number two is the permission level. And at level number two, the permission level, the key word is relationships. It's at this level that people follow you, not, not because they have to, they're now following you and they're following me because they want to. This is a wonderful level to be on. Let me explain this level for a moment. You see, at this level, you like people and people like you. I found out a long time ago that people won't go along with you if they can't get along with you. And again, every one of us have known people that we worked with or worked for that we didn't like. And it's not any fun to follow people that you don't like. It's just not any fun. And yet I have found that at this level, number two, they, they begin to like you and you begin to like them. And sometimes, you know what, I sometimes call this the second mile level because at level number two, people stay longer. Maybe they stay after work. If you're in a major project, they don't go home at five. They may start, stay till seven, 7.30 at night. They may come in the next morning at 6.30 in the morning. Why? Because there's a connection. There's a relationship. They like you. You like them. They'll go the second mile with you. It's a wonderful level to be on. I would say one more thing about the second level before we go to the third. Whenever I talk to people who want to increase their leadership and want to certainly increase their level of influence, I share with them that they need to work hard on their people skills. It is true. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And your ability to connect with people, such as in the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, where I teach about the law of connection, where leaders touch a heart before they ask for a hand. Your ability to connect with people, your ability at level number two to relate well to people is absolutely huge in your success. Now, if you do that well, there's a high chance you can get to level number three. Level number three is called the production level. And at level number three, the key word is results. What you're going to find at level number three is people follow because of what you have done for the organization. They follow you, they follow me because of what we have done for the organization. Now, this is absolutely huge. In other words, they basically describe you kind of like this. Before John came to this organization, we financially weren't doing good. Our bottom line wasn't good. Our profit wasn't what it should be. Now, all of a sudden, the profit's getting good. The bottom line's a lot better. The morale's up. Now, when they start talking about you in terms of, of endearment and kind of with a, a sense of respect, you, you know that you're on level number three because the company is growing because you're leading. Now, at level number three, the production level something wonderful happens to your organization. At level number three, momentum kicks in. Uh, this is where uh, you get the big mo going for you. This is where you get this, um, this winning feeling. You get this winning environment, this winning atmosphere. Uh, you're kind of ready to take on anything that's in front of you. You're ready for a new challenge, a bigger challenge. Why? Because you're getting success now under your belt. People are feeling good about themselves. People are feeling good about you as the leader. A lot of self-confidence, good attitudes. All this happens at level number three when you begin to produce for your organization. Now, a lot of times, and sadly, I see this happen all the time in organizations, a lot of companies stop at level number three. They think getting some bottom line profits and, and just having good morale is kind of the essence of what the company should be all about. But I'm here to tell you, as I teach leadership all across the country and literally internationally, my goal is not just to get you to level three, because if you get to level three, you're doing well, but there's so much more potential that you have. I want you to go to level number four. In fact, it's my goal to get you to level number four. You see, 
the fourth level of leadership, the fourth level of influence is the people development level. And at level number four, when you're developing people, the key word is reproduction. Now you're beginning to reproduce yourself. In fact, I want to make sure you understand the difference in these levels. You see, at level number four, the people development level, people follow you because of what you have done for them. Now notice the difference. At level number three, people follow you because of what you've done for the organization. At level number four, that people follow you because of what you've done for them. Now, all of a sudden, you're developing your people. You're making them better. You're training them. You're equipping them. You're building into their life. You're adding value to them. Here's the difference. If I belong to the XYZ company, and at level number three, you've been the leader now for five or six years, and we're making good profits, and we're all collecting some good dividends and decent salaries, the whole deal. I really follow you as a leader because of what you've done for the organization. But let me tell you, you come to me and you say, John... I want to develop you as a person. I want to develop you as a leader. I want to train you. I want to equip you. I want to make you better. And all of a sudden, you start as, the, as one of the leaders of the XYZ company. You begin to pour your life into me. Now, let me say something. Six months, eight months, a year from now, wow, I begin to grow. Man, my wife says, John, uh, you're getting to be a good leader. And the people in my department, they're, they're, just, they're doing better with me, and I'm doing better with them. Now, let me tell you something. At level number four, when you start developing me, and at level number four, when you start developing the people in your organization, let me tell you what happens there. Just as at level number three, momentum kicks in and the company's feeling good about itself, at level number four, loyalty becomes a key factor. You see, at level number four, because you're developing people, they become very loyal to you because they begin to see themselves and say, I am much better now than I used to be. I'm performing at a higher level. I'm getting a better return. And they'll look to you, and they'll give you the credit. Now, I want to stop here for a moment because my commitment in teaching leadership is to always get you to level number four. Because here's what I know. If you have the position or the title, and if you relate well with people, and they like you, and you like them, and so you get along so you can go along, and if... You're giving good bottom line results to the company that you're working with. And if you're developing people, you are now beginning to layer your leadership in such a way that you have a foundation that you can do incredible things for yourself, for others, and for your company. And at level number four, I've been privileged to be there for many years with a lot of key players in my companies. And I can tell you, how I feel toward them and how they feel toward me, no feeling can replace. I love them. I believe in them. Their success becomes my success. Um, I laugh with them. I cry with them. We take trips together. We enjoy being together. There's a relationship that you get at level number four that's much better than level number two. And let me explain the difference. At level number two, when we're having a good relationship, we just like each other. At level number four, we not only like each other, we're having success experiences together. And we have stories to tell. We have victories to talk about. We have battles that we were in that, that we won. And we're just building a huge, huge kind of group team resume of the successes that we've had together. And it's a great level to get on. Now, let me say something about these levels. Level number one is given to you. You join a company. Levels two, three, and four, you must earn. If you do the middle three correctly, if you relate well with people, if you produce, if you develop others, if you do those first three, if those middle three well, let me tell you what happened. Just as the first one is given to you by the company, here's what I love. The last level will be given to you by the people. For level number five is the personhood level. And the key word is respect. You see at level number five, people follow because of who you are 
and because of what you represent. In other words, let me explain it to you this way. You have done it so well with so many for so long that after a while you find they are literally lifting you on their shoulders. It's almost like the team does for a winning coach after they win a championship and they pick them up and carry them off the field. To be truthful with you, if you do those first four levels well, there's a time when your people will pick you up. You never need to declare that you're on level number five, that people declare it for you. It's a wonderful level to be on. Somebody says, well, how do I get to level number five? It's very simple. Do the first four levels well. If you do the first four levels well, number five is automatic. Now, if I were you and I was taking these notes and I just listened to the five levels of leadership influence, the question, I would begin asking myself some questions and I would begin to want to pull out some truths and principles that are huge. Let me give you seven things that I want you to know about climbing the steps of leadership. Number one, the higher you go, the longer it takes. Now, I don't even think I need to explain that to you. You understand that, don't you? You don't get to level number five immediately. In other words, you don't walk into your company, get on level number one and say, oh, well, this is good on Monday. Could I be on level five by Friday? <laughs> no, by Friday, you get to find out how to get to your office without getting lost. <laughs> it takes a while. Remember, we're not trying to microwave leaders. We're trying to crockpot them. This is a crock-pot process. It's a fact that it's going to take a while for you to go from level one to two to three to four to five. It's going to take a long time. The second thing I want to share with you is this. The higher you go, the higher the level of commitment. And the higher the level of commitment is both your commitment to your people and their commitment to you. For example, if we go back to level number one for a second. When people follow you because they have to, they're not highly committed to you. They're not highly committed to following you. But every time you go up another level, your commitment to them and their commitment to you increases. That's why when people look to me and they say, John, I want to get a high level of commitment with my people. See, they're working on the wrong thing. They're working on getting commitment out of their people. They ought to work on climbing the levels of influence with their people. Because when you get to level number four, the commitment is there. The third observation I would like to make is, the higher you go, the easier it is to lead. Some people ask me sometimes, they say, John, is it possible for leadership to get easier? My answer is always the same. Of course it is. Every time you climb those steps, it gets easier. And let me explain why. Every time you climb a step, you have put another foundation underneath your leadership belt. So people at level number four that are with you because you've developed them, oh my goodness, they're much more quick to follow you than people who are just at level number one. Fourth observation, the higher you go, the greater your success. The greater your success, the greater the success of the company. It just not only gets easier to lead, it gets a lot more profitable. Number five. You never leave a level below, you build on it. Now, let's go back and look at the levels for just a second. And probably if I could, I would literally put lines here because what I want you to understand is every time you go to another level, you're stepping and deepening your foundation. So as the higher you go, the more foundation you have underneath of you. And what I want you to realize is, that you never leave level one when you go to level two. You're still at level one. You're just on level one, but you happen to be also on level two. So each time you go another level, when you're on level number three, what it means is you're on level three with some people, you're on level two with some people, and you're on level one with some people. So here's what I'm saying is, when you get to the production side and you start producing results, you don't say, thank God I'm on level number three. And I don't have to fool with that permission relationship level anymore. Boy, that was tough. I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore. Thank God, you know. Now I can, now I can, I don't care what people think. I'm just going to produce. No, 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 no. Remember this. If you ignore the level that you just left, that level will pull you down every time. Observation number six. As a leader, you won't be on the same level with all of your people. 
Let me illustrate. Let's say you have 100 people in your company. All 100 of them are on level number one with you. Does that make sense? You've got the title, you've got position. But when you go to level number two, which is relationships, not all 100 people will go up to level two with you. There'll be a few that stay at level one. So for teaching's sake, let's say that if you have 100 people at level number one, let's say 80 people go to level number two. 20 people stay behind. Okay, now, those 100 people are still with you. They're just on level one. But 80 of those people are on level number two. When you start producing and giving results, not everybody's going to produce. Not everybody's going to give you results. So let's say, again, you leave some others behind. So you go from 80 to level number three, you've got 60 with you. When you go from level three to level four, where you start developing people, let's say you only have 40. Now, now here's what I want you to see. At every level, you have different people with you. And the higher you go, the less people that you have with you in the levels of leadership. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, this is very important. And what makes this important is this. When you cast vision, many times I've seen this, where leaders, presidents of organizations, have cast a vision, and they get different responses from their people. In other words, they'll cast a vision, and, and one person says, my goodness, this is a great vision. I can hardly wait to roll up my sleeves. Another person says, boy, I can hardly wait to leave the company. <laughs> and they'll come to me, and they'll say, what happened? You know, I was in the same group with the same people at the same time, cast with the same vision, and they have all these different responses. Now, here's what I want you to see. People will respond to your vision. They'll respond to your leadership based on the level you're on with them. Let me explain. I have 100 people in my organization. I have 100 people on level number one with me. I have 80 on level number two. I have 60 on level number three. I have 40 on level number four. Now, let's, let's say that I'm asking for a huge commitment. Here's what I want you to know. The people up on these higher levels, they'll commit quickly and they'll commit deeply because they've taken the journey with me. The people on level number one, who are following me because they have to, they won't be near as deep or near as committed to me as people on level three or four. Does that make sense to you? Yes. I want to make the final observation and then drive home the point. The seventh observation is you must work to carry other leaders with you up the steps. Very simply stated, it's important for you to take what I call your inner circle. In the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, one of the laws is the law of the inner circle. The law of the inner circle basically says those closest to you will determine the level of your success. You want to make sure you take them up with you because if you take your leaders, your inner circle with you, they'll keep you there. I've seen times where leaders failed to take their key people up the levels of influence with them. And, and people follow them, some of them, but but the key influencers, the leaders, the inner circle stayed down here. That's a bad scene. It's only a matter of time till these influencers will begin to pull you right back down. So ask yourself this question. Am I taking my inner circle up the levels of influence with me? Am I taking the key players on my team up the levels of leadership with me? It's important for you to go up the levels, but it's important for you to take especially the key people up those levels with you. One more thought on the five levels of leadership, and then I want to do some teaching, especially on the three middle levels. I would encourage you, on your own, to really study the five levels of leadership. If you want to know more about it, I would encourage you to pick up a book that I wrote in 1993 called Developing the Leader Within You. I have a whole chapter just absolutely committed to teaching the five levels of leadership. I've had many people study the five levels of leadership and say, it changed my life when I began to understand that my organization or my company doesn't take me to the next level. I take myself to the next level. See, your future isn't based on your organization. Your future is based on you. And your ability to understand these five levels and how to go from step to step to get to the top.
So let's talk about what I call the three key levels out of these five levels of leadership, the three key levels of influence or leadership. Now, I've already said, number one is given to you. Number five is automatic. In other words, the company gives you level number one. The people give you level number five. But you've got to do numbers two, three, and four well. Level number two is the permission level. That's your ability to connect with people. Level number three is the production level. That's your ability to lead people and the organization. And level number four is the people development level. In other words, your ability to grow and train people. Let's take a moment and let's make sure that we get all these levels under our belt. Let's talk, first of all, about level number two, the permission level. In other words, your ability to connect with people. Fred Smith said it well. He said, leadership is getting people to work for you when they're not obligated. I was doing a uh, President's Day uh, for Johnson Controls a, a few years ago. They basically brought in companies that they work with, and they take and give a day to the presidents of all these companies, uh, a leadership day. And so they asked me to come in. In fact, they asked me to come in and teach the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership to about 150 CEOs and presidents. And I'll never forget this because we were in a question and answer period. And one of the presidents of the company raised his hand and said, John, I've got a question to ask you. He said, I have about five or six really good leaders. And he said, I'm trying to get ready to, to bring one of them up to a whole new position. And he said, I don't know which one is the best leader. He said, do you have any suggestions of how I can know who my best of the six leaders would be? I said, yes, I do. I said, what would happen if you took those six leaders and went into your community and put each one of them in charge of a volunteer community project? In other words, said, I want you for the next six months to lead this community project. I want you to lead this one. And, and they were, had to be volunteers. Not, people weren't paid. It had to be leading volunteers. I said, here's what I want you to know. The best leader of the six will be the one who can most successfully lead volunteers. Let me put it this way. You never know what kind of a leader you are until you lead people who don't have to follow. <laughs> Oh, so many times we use the paycheck and we use the leverage and people say, well, okay, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. And basically, you're not leading them, you're, you're controlling them. But see, when you lead volunteers, when you lead people that don't have to follow you and you can lead them successfully, you become absolutely huge as far as your ability to produce as a leader. Well, level number two, the permission level, is exactly what I'm talking about. I remember... Uh, Last year, I had the privilege of the Keene family asked me to speak for Martin Luther King's uh, birthday and honoring him on his, uh, on his national holiday. And I remember as I was able to do that, what an honor it was for me to do that. And I explained to not only the audience, but the TV audience all across America, I said, what made him such a great leader is he created a movement out of people that didn't have position. They didn't have titles. They were just people that were hurting and people, obviously, that had been taken advantage of. And I said, he became a great leader because he led by permission. He felt their needs. He saw their hurts. And he related and he connected with them. And he took it from, from, from the bottom clear up to the top. That's what good leaders can do. Let me give you two connecting thoughts on level number two, permission level. First connecting thought is this. Connecting with people begins with caring for people. If you want to connect with people, you've got to care for people. Let me put it this way. You can love people without leading them, but you cannot lead people without loving them. What I have found is that many organizations fail to understand this principle of connecting. And they have leaders who have not connected relationally with people. Look in your notes at the difference between high achievers and low achievers. I think this is awesome. This was a survey in the Wall Street Journal of 16,000 executives. They studied 16,000 executives, and this is what they came up with. High achievers cared about people as well as profits, where low achievers were preoccupied with their own security. In other words, boy, I just got to keep my job. High achievers viewed subordinates optimistically where low achievers showed a basic distrust for subordinates. Are you seeing the difference? High achievers sought advice. They were listeners. 
Low achievers, they avoided communication. In fact, you know what low achievers did? They relied on policy manuals. <laughs> oh. Whenever you have a leader in an organization who basically is saying, we've got to rely on the policy manual, you do not have a leader. Notice the difference between high achievers and low achievers. Let me give you a second connecting thought that fits in with level number two, the permission level. The second connecting thought is this one. Connecting with people continues by communicating with people. In other words, you keep connecting when you keep communicating. And I have found a very simple little method that I've used for years that helps me to keep connected and keep communicating with people. It's what I call the help method. All great communicators do the following four things to keep connected with their people. The letter H stands for hope. Very simply stated, they offer hope to their people. The letter E stands for encouragement. They come around and encourage them with their words and with their actions. The letter L stands for love. People really know that they care about them. And the letter P stands for personal value. Great leaders really increase the personal value of the people that were with them. The permission level is a huge level. It's one of people skills, it's one of relationships, it's one of connecting and getting along with people. Perhaps as we're talking about these levels of influence, this is your weak area. Then I would encourage you, uh, spend some time with people that are relationally strong. Uh, begin to develop a plan, a process for you to become better in this area because here's what I know. Until people like you, they won't follow you. So you've got to connect with them relationally. Level number two, the permission level, talks all about that. Let's talk about level number three. The third level is the production level. And the production level talks about your ability to lead people and the organization. Now we're talking about results. And let me explain this when I start talking to you about results. Henry Ford was exactly right when he said, you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. <laughs> I know all kinds of people that come around and say, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, this and I'm going to do that. Now, now, I want to tell you something. You can't build your reputation on what you're going to do. You build your reputation on what you're doing. Peter Drucker one time said, there are two types of people. There are some people that are into results, and there are some people that are into reasons why they haven't produced results. I've always said the number one characteristic of a potential leader is the ability to make things happen. In fact, I always tell people, if you're looking for a potential leader, the first thing you do is you go find somebody who can make something happen. And let me explain to you why. If you can't make something happen for yourself, you'll never be able to make something happen for someone else. You see, level three is the make something happen level. Level number three is basically you produce, you accomplish something, you bring home the bacon, you have results. In your notes, I have a statement that I want you to see. The statement says, your accomplishments are much more vital to your success than your seniority. When a recent survey asked executives and personnel directors what would be the most influential factor in evaluating an employee for promotion, 96% said specific accomplishments. 4% said seniority. So don't bank on your success being the fact that you've been with the company a long time. You've got to produce something. You've got to be able to accomplish something. You've got to be able to, you've got to, be able to, to bring results to your organization. I, I love the cartoon I have in your notes. It says, we run our business like a game show. Produce and you come back. Don't produce and we have some lovely parting gifts for you. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things I've ever had in the area of leadership and production is the article in your workbook called Sell, Not Spell. Hang with me. Are you ready? A newly hired traveling salesman wrote his first sales report to the home office. It so stunned the brass in the sales department because it was obvious the new salesman was ignorant. Here's what he wrote. I seen this outfit which they ain't never bought a dime's worth of nothing from us. 
and I sold them some goods, and I'm now going to Chicago. Before the man could be given the heave-ho by the sales manager, along came this letter from Chicago. I come here and sold them half a million. <laughs> Fearful if he did, and, and afraid if he didn't, fire the ignorant salesman. The sales manager dumped the problem in the lap of the president. In the following morning, the ivory-towered sales department members were amazed to see posted on the bulletin board above the two letters written by the ignorant salesman, this memo from the president. We've been spending too much time trying to spell instead of trying to sell. Let's watch those sales. I want everybody should read these letters from Gooch, who is on the road doing a great job for us, and you should go out and do like he done. <laughs> <laughs> Says it all, doesn't it, huh? Walt Whitman said it best. He said, there's a man in the world who never gets turned down. Whenever he chances to stray, he gets the glad hand in the populous town or out where the farmers make hay. He is greeted with pleasure on deserts of sand and deep in the aisles of the woods. Wherever he goes, there is a welcoming hand. He's the man who delivers the goods. Level number three is the production level, the ability to produce. Now, you can relate well to people on level two. You can produce on level three. The third important key level of these middle five levels is level number four. That's the people development level. Your ability to grow and train people. In my 17 indisputable laws of teamwork, law number four is the law of Mount Everest. And the law of Mount Everest says, as the challenge escalates, the need for teamwork elevates. I think there are three Mount Everest questions you need to ask yourself. Three that I need to ask myself. If I'm going to climb Mount Everest, well, here are the three questions I've got to ask. Question number one, what's my dream? Because it's possible that you don't have a Mount Everest dream. You know, in Atlanta, there's a, there's a little hill. It's called Stone Mountain. We call it a mountain. It's not really a mountain. It's a kind of a, just a ball-headed hill is what it really is. <laughs> It's a naked hill. That's what it is. Ball head. It's not a big hill. Now, you see, if I, I want to climb Stone Mountain, I, I don't need to develop a team. I, I just basically can get my shorts and sneakers on, and I go over there, and about an hour and a half, I, I get to the top of Stone Mountain. It's not really a big deal. It's just a hike. Now, if I'm going to climb Mount Everest, that's a whole different issue. You see... I've got to ask myself those three Mount Everest questions. Question number one is, what is my dream? And question number two is, who is on my team? And the reason I need to ask the question, who's on my team, is because my team is going to determine my dream. Let me give you a, an example of a dream that will never be fulfilled. An example of a dream that will never be fulfilled is when you have like a, a nine dream and a two team. Now the two team can look at the mountain, they can talk about the mountain. They can even put the mountain on their refrigerator. <laughs> but they'll never get there. A two team doesn't climb a nine dream. In fact, here's the way it should work. Your team has to be equal with the level of your dream. If you've got a seven dream, you've got to have a seven team. If you've got a nine dream, you've got to have a nine team. Your, your team has to be as good as your dream, or your dream will never be accomplished. So, I've got to ask myself the question, what's my dream? And I've got to ask myself the question, who's on my team? And most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find your dream is bigger than your team. That's just the way it works. Because in the beginning, you develop a dream, and, and you're working on that dream, and then, and then all of a sudden you realize that you've got to put a team together, and the team you put together isn't nearly going to be the size of your dream, so you've got to develop them. That's why you have to develop people. You've got to raise your people up to the level of your dream. But here's what I have found. Usually, the dream is bigger than the team, almost always, which brings me to question number three. What should my dream team look like? Get a picture of not only your dream, Get a picture of your dream team. In fact, I would say if you're only going to have one picture, have a picture of your dream team. Because your dream team is what's going to deliver the goods for you. 
And it's at level number four that you begin to develop people. You see, again, if I were taking notes and I was looking at the five levels of leadership and I was understanding that level number four was people development, I began asking myself the question, what am I doing to develop people? What am I doing to build my team? How am I selecting them? How am I recruiting them? What am I pouring into them? How much time? How much money? How much energy am I investing into my dream team? Another one of the laws of the 17 indisputable laws of teamwork is law number 11. It's called the law of the bench. And the law of the bench says great teams have great depth. And you see, the future of a team can be predicted by three things. And I have found all you need to do is see three things to predict the future of any team. Number one is recruitment. Simply stated, who's joining the team? Number two is training. The question needs to be asked. Are the team members being developed? And the third issue is losses. Who's leaving the team? You know, I've got to ask myself who's coming in. Who's going out? And what I found about all organizations is this. All organizations is like sitting in the lobby of a busy hotel with a revolving door. People are coming in and people are going out. People are coming in and people are going out. In any company, any organization, that's exactly what happens. People are being hired and people are being let go. People are leaving, people are coming. It's just an in and out question. The question is not are people coming in and people are going out. I run people all the time and say, well, we're losing people. Well, sure, you're losing people, you're gaining people. That's the, way, that's the way it is. Here's the question. The question is not are you losing people or are you gaining people. That's not the question. The question is who are you gaining and who are you losing? Let's look at our people that we're recruiting and look at the people that we're losing. For example, let me tell you a, a company that's in trouble. A company is in trouble when threes and fours are coming in and eights and nines are going out. You're in deep weeds. A company is in good shape when eights and nines are coming in. And threes and fours are going out. So the question is not, are you losing people? The question is, who are you losing? The question is not, are you recruiting people? The question is, who are you gaining? Who are you recruiting? So when I look at the future of a team, I ask myself, who are they recruiting? How are they training? And who's leaving them? That tells me all I need to know about what kind of a future a company has. So if I were sitting listening to the five levels of leadership lecture, knowing that I wanted to get to level number four, knowing that if I can get to level number four, I'm going to be a great leader. If I realized that level number four really probably held the key to my success as a leader, the ability to develop people, I would very carefully listen to these next five minutes because these are going to be the key minutes to getting you to level number four. What are the keys to finding and keeping good people? Number one is recruit them strategically. Don't just recruit people. Uh, this isn't like a lottery. Don't just open the door and say, you all come. What I found is when you open the door and say, you all come, the wrong people always come. You have to recruit people strategically. What I mean by that is you have to know what you're looking for and you have to know where to look. Did you get that? You have to know what you're looking for and you have to know where to look. I have found that if you really want to get a winner, if you really want to recruit a 9 or a 10, you've got to find somebody that already is doing a job very well and loving it very much. And you've got to bring them on your team. You've got to go find them. The person who's outside the door waiting for a job is probably not the one you want. You have to recruit them strategically. Number two, you have to develop them continually. Remember the law of process and the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership? The law of process says leaders develop daily, not in a day. And what I'm saying here is that if you and I are going to really develop our people, it's not like one program, one time, or one event at one place. No, 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 no. It's a commitment to develop people on a continual basis. Here's what I know. I have been training and developing people for over 20 years. 
It's never stopped. And in my organizations where I've literally developed and trained hundreds of leaders, many times I've been asked, have you trained all your people? Have you developed all your people? Can I tell you? You never train all your people. You never develop. It, it never is over because you're recruiting new people. And if you're recruiting new people, you've got to train them. I've never had somebody come in and say, already trained. Thank you very much. <laughs> already developed. Thank you very much. Got this one down. You don't have to work hard for me. No. <laughs> Uh, not in my lifetime. Not in my lifetime. So you have to recruit people strategically. You have to secondly develop them continually. Thirdly, you have to place them correctly. You've got to place them correctly. You've got to understand that the key to getting people to be successful is to put them where their strengths are. A lot of people are not successful, not because they couldn't be successful. A lot of people are not successful because they've never had a leader know what their strengths are, and strategically place them where they can maximize their abilities, gifts, talents, and opportunities. That's very key. And number four, the fourth thing that you and I want to do is we want to value them highly. Remember, people are your only appreciable asset. So you've got to pour your time in them. They're worth it. They have the ability to make you bigger and have the ability to make you better. Now, the last thing in your lesson notes in the five levels of leadership is I have placed for you each level. And I've done my best to tell you what to do on that level to be successful so you can go to the next level. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you grow an influence? one level at a time. So I want you to look at this on your own and know that at level number one there are a half a dozen things that you can do to, to be successful and if you do that well then you can go to level number two and, and, and you again follow through with your game plan there and, and if you do that well you can, you can go to level number three and, and I have again successful characteristics at every level. I'm just trying to help you to, to know what you've got to put under your belt, what you have to do well to not only exceed but how you can go to the next level. It's a very practical step-by-step -step process that I want you to work out. And on step number four, the same. And then we finally have step number five. All of these levels are key. But if you would allow me on level number four, because my passion is get you to the people development level, at level number four, I would like to say the following things and just read this to you and comment in a couple of places. The first successful characteristic at this level, number four, is to place top priority on developing people. They are your most valuable asset that you have. In other words, if I, if I could walk into your life right now, if I, could, if, I could, if I could walk out through the people in this audience here today and I could ask you one question, I wouldn't ask you one question because I'd have to ask you two. Because the two questions I would ask you is, number one, what's your plan to develop yourself? And question number two is, what's your plan to develop people? Now, you have to develop yourself first because you cannot give what you do not have, and the way to grow people is to grow yourself. So start with yourself. That's not being selfish. It's being realistic. Get on a personal growth plan for yourself. Continually listen to leadership tapes and watch leadership videos and read leadership books and continually absorb those things in leadership because here's what I want you to know. You've got to learn how to go from one level to another and as you grow from one level to the other, here's the good news. If I have grown to the people development level number four, if I have grown to this level myself, here's what I want you to know. If I have grown there, I can grow people there. If I am there, I can take you with me. I cannot take you where I've never been. So if I don't know how to develop people, let's say I'm just good at relationships. I never produce. I never develop people. I'm just good at love. Can I tell you something? My people can go no higher than I can go. They can go no higher. If I'm on level number two, people will only go to level number two under my leadership. So, very simple. Your growth determines the growth of your people. So the first question I'd ask you is, what's your plan for developing yourself? And the second question I would ask you is, what's your plan for developing your people? And at level number four, place top priority on developing people. 
The second thing that will help you to be successful at this level is to be a model that others can follow. Be an example. Number three, pour your leadership efforts into the top 20% because they're going to give you 80% of the return. Number four, expose your leaders to growth opportunities, training seminars such as this where you can help them to learn more about leadership. Number four, equip leaders to equip others. And here's why I wanted to go to level number four. Because before I close this teaching on the five levels of leadership, I want to make sure that you have down what I call the five-step equipping process. How do you equip people? And how do you know that you've equipped someone successfully? Step one, I do it. Step two, I do it. You're with me. In other words, you're observing. You're watching me. It's show and tell time. I'm showing you how to do this. Step three, you do it. And I'm with you. Now the baton has switched hands. In step number two, I'm doing it, and you're watching me taking notes, asking questions. In step number three, you're doing it, and I'm watching you. I'm asking you questions, making sure you understand all the things that you're doing and performing. Step number four, you do it. Too many times at a step number four, we think we've equipped somebody. We say, oh, good, now they're doing it on their own. No, 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 no. You're still incomplete of equipping a person until you get to step number five. For step number five is, you do it, and someone is with you. You have never truly equipped somebody until the person you have equipped has equipped somebody. You are training people to train people. You are developing people to develop people. You are leading people to lead people. It always goes at least two generations. The five levels of leadership. What, what level are you on? What level do you want to be on? How many people are on the highest level that you're on with you right now? Who do you need to take up to those levels? Study this video. Spend time in the five levels of influence. Ask yourself these kind of questions. Put names on every level that you're on so that you know who's on level three with you and who's on level two with you and who's on level one with you. And remember, you don't lead them the same. You lead them according to the level that you're on with them. And enjoy the trip. Because your goal and your aim is not to get to level number five by yourself. Your goal and aim is to take someone with you. Nothing's more fun than to get to the top with somebody else and enjoy the view together. Thank you very much. Thank you.